Good evening, Union Road family. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. We'll spend a majority of our time there tonight. Our focus for the month of July has been following God in the home. And with so many weddings around the corner, it's time for us to take a step back and look at marriage. And when we think about marriage, there are two basic things that we need to know. God designed marriage and God provided the blueprint. God's word provided the blueprint for a godly marriage. And so if we want to follow God in our homes, if we want to follow God in our marriages, then we need to see what Jesus says on marriage. Which brings us to our text this morning, or this evening rather, in Matthew chapter 19. So in Matthew chapter 19, the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, come to Jesus and they ask him a question. Can a man divorce his wife for any cause? They're trying to test Jesus. They're trying to trap Jesus. They want Jesus to take a side in their years-long rabbinical discussion on the idea, the concept of divorce. You see, in the Jewish world, there were two basic schools of thought when it came to the idea of divorce. The first school of thought was a little more liberal that taught that a man could divorce his wife at any time for any reason, for any cause. So basically, she wakes up one morning and burns the toast, you could divorce her. You wake up one day and she starts to smell just a tad bit funny, you could divorce her. Any reason whatsoever, you could divorce your wife. Another Jewish school of thought there was, said there was only one reason you could divorce your wife, and that was for unfaithfulness. And so now these Jewish leaders come to Jesus and say, how do you answer this question? What do you say about that? And I love Jesus' response here in the text. When we look there in Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse 4, we'll go ahead and read all the way down to verse 11, and then we'll make a couple of basic points from the text. Here in Matthew 19, verse 4, Jesus responds, Haven't you read, he, that's Jesus, replied, that he, that's God, who created them in the beginning, made them male and female. And he also said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and will be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked him, did Moses command us to give us divorce papers and send her away? He told him, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your hearts. But it was not like that from the beginning. I tell you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And his disciples said to him, Jesus that is, if the relationship of man with his wife is like this, it's better not to marry. And Jesus responds in verse 11, not everyone can accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. What's so interesting about Jesus' response here in Matthew chapter 19 is that he doesn't pick a side in their rabbinical debates. He looks to Scripture. And Jesus goes all the way back to beginning to Genesis 1 and 2. And I think there's a very important lesson for us that as we look to understand what God wants for our life, what God desires for our life, what God's will is today, that we need to start with Scripture. We need to go back to God's Word. And here in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus goes back to the beginning to teach the Pharisees and us a very important lesson about marriage. And here in Matthew 19, and we'll go to one other passage to pull a third point out, but we'll see three principles, three first principles, we may call, say, that teach us, that for us to keep in mind as we think about following God in our marriage, to see what Jesus says on marriage. But maybe tonight you're 16 years old, like I was a long time ago, and you're thinking, I am never going to get married. And you're like, okay, I'm going to tune this sermon out. That's what I said. I never thought I was going to get married when I was 16. I'm married and have a kid. So still, 
listen up. You never know when that special someone's going to come along and sweep you off your feet a couple of times. But maybe you're past the season in your life where you want to get married or you're going to get married and you're going, well, I'm not going to get married. So I guess I can tune this sermon out. You can still remind us, those of us who are married, to follow God in our marriage. You can still remind us and encourage us, those of us who are married, to follow God in our homes. And so I ask you to pay attention still to help us, those of us who are married, to encourage us as we seek to follow Jesus on marriage. The first big principle I see here in Matthew chapter 19 is that marriage is for a man and a woman. Now, I realize that is a very unpopular thing to say in our society. But what Jesus says here in Matthew 19 is that in the beginning, God says, I made them male and female. God created them, Adam and Eve. Jesus here in Matthew 19 looks back to Genesis chapter 1, where God creates Adam. And Adam is there alone in the garden. In Genesis 2, God creates You know, if it was God's will for man to be alone, God could have left Adam alone in the garden. If it was God's will for man to have multiple wives, God could have created multiple Eves for Adam. If it was God's will for Adam to have multiple husbands, to have a homosexual relationship, he could have created another Adam for Adam. But that's not what God did there in the beginning. That in the beginning, God created them male and female, husband and wife. That all the way back in Genesis 1 and 2, God defined marriage as one man, one woman for life. That's God's plan. And that's God's teaching, or Jesus' is teaching here in the text of Matthew 19. So what we need to understand about marriage is that God designed it, God defined it, we cannot change it. That is a very unpopular thing to say in our society. But what Jesus is saying here in Matthew chapter 19 is that marriage was established by God. Marriage was not a product of culture. It wasn't created by the government. Marriage was created by God. And only God has the authority to define marriage. Not the government, not the Supreme Court, only God. God designed divine marriage before government existed. He designed marriage before There was a supreme court. And now here in Matthew 19, Jesus looks back to creation when Scripture, when God defined it as one man, one woman for life. And so what we need to understand is that our government or any government whatsoever does not have the right, does not have the authority to define marriage. That right and that right alone belongs to God. And yet because of our society and because of our culture, there is a temptation for us to try to redefine marriage, to redesign marriage. But we need to understand that even as the people of God today, we do not have the right, we do not have the authority to redesign marriage. That's God's prerogative and God's alone. The government doesn't have that right. The church doesn't have that right. We do not have that right. And any attempt to redefine marriage will lead to our destruction. Go with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 provides this picture of a life, uh, of what happens when we try to alter God's plan. There in Romans chapter 1, Paul's writing to the Romans, Romans, ironically, and he's describing this world of what happens when we reject God's plan. In Romans chapter 1, Beginning in verse 25, Paul says, They exchanged, that's the Gentile world, the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served what has been created instead of the Creator, who is praised forever. Amen. For this reason, God delivered them over to disgraceful passions. Their women exchanged their natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. The men in the same way also left natural relations for women with women and were inflamed in their lust for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received 
in their own persons the appropriate penalty of their error. And because, verse 28, they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to a corrupt mind so that they would not do what is not right. They are filled, Paul says, with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, and wickedness. They are full of evil, envy, murder, quarrels, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanders, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, senseless, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. And although they know God's just sentence, those, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they even applaud others who practice them. Doesn't Romans 1 sound like our society? like the world that we live in, a society that has rejected God, a society that has rejected God's design for marriage, a society that is reaping the consequences of rejecting God in every possible way. Standing up for the biblical definition of marriage is an unpopular thing to do these days. It's going to put us in conflict with our family. It's going to put us in conflict with our friends, with our co-workers. But if we want to follow God in the home, if we want to follow God in our marriages, if we want to listen and apply what Jesus has to say on the topic of marriage, then we need to remember that marriage is between one man and one woman for life. And we need to be teaching this to our children. If you're a parent today, realize that the world that your kids are growing up in is vastly different than the world that you grew up in 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. It's a world where homosexuality is encouraged. It's a world that does not know God and has rejected God's design for the marriage relationship. Understand that. Make sure your kids understand that. Be teaching them, be busy teaching them what Jesus has to say on marriage. But the second principle we need to see here in the text is that marriage is a covenant relationship. Jesus says here in Matthew 19, really in particularly verse 5, that marriage is a declaration that we are leaving our father and mother and we are being joined to our spouse and that we will become one flesh. That's what it means to be in a covenant relationship. It's a bond that is never to be broken. It's a lifelong bond. And yet so often we talk about marriage right now, we talk about Man, marriage being a man and a woman, and sometimes we kind of forget that it's a man and a woman for life. But what Jesus is saying here in the text of Matthew chapter 19, it's, it is for a man and a woman, but it's also between a man and a woman for life. That it's a covenant relationship. And that idea goes all the way back to the beginning, where Jesus describes that picture there at creation of how Adam and Eve were in that covenant relationship, where they were stuck together like glue. But in particular, he looks back to Genesis 1 and 2 and describes in that picture there in Genesis 1 and 2 where Adam is alone. And God realizes that Adam needs a helper, a companion, a friend. So God created Eve to meet that need. That's the relational aspect of marriage. And this has huge implications for our marriage relationship. It has really huge implications for our dating relationship. That if marriage is built on the foundation of friendship, then we need to be dating people who we can be friends with, right? But not only that, we need to be very careful about entering that marriage covenant relationship with people who don't share that faith. We need to be very careful about that. You see, our spiritual lives are sometimes like rowing a boat. That if I'm trying to row to heaven and my spouse is not, that's going to affect my ability to get to my final destination. Or if you're trying to 
row to heaven and your spouse is not, that's going to affect your ability to get to your final destination. One of the things we need to realize is that marriage is a covenant relationship that has tremendous impact on our spiritual life. So yes, marriage is about friendship, but it goes deeper than that. Marriage is more than just wanting to be with someone at the end of a long day at work, although we probably should want to be with our spouse after a long day at work. Marriage is more than just wanting to be excited about being with someone on a date on a Friday night, although we probably should be excited to spend time with our significant other. Marriage is more than thinking our spouse or significant other smells like rainbows and lollipop and sunshine on a summer day, although we probably should think our spouse smells like sunshine and rainbows and lollipops on a summer day. But there will come a day when they don't smell like sunshines and rainbows and lollipops on a summer day. And that's why Jesus says that marriage is about two people being joined together by God for life. That's the covenantal aspect of marriage. That when we are married to our spouse, we stick with them even when they don't smell good. We stick with them even when things aren't going well. We stick with them for life. In marriage, everything becomes one. Physically, emotionally, financially, everything becomes one. We become one family, and what God has joined together, let no one separate. That's what a covenant relationship is all about. That's God's law. That's what Jesus says on marriage, and yet that's not the law of our land. Since the first no-fault divorce law was signed by Governor Ronald Reagan of California in 1969, Marriage has been under attack. Between the years of 1960 and 1980, divorce rate in America doubled. In the 1970s alone, 50% of kids born in the 70s were born to parents that divorced. And the numbers have only gotten worse. But if we are going to be lights in the world around us, if we are going to follow God in our home, if we are going to listen to Jesus' teaching on marriage, then we need to use this as an opportunity, use our marriages as as an opportunity to shine the light of God's design for the family through our marriage. We need to apply what Jesus is teaching on marriage and remember that marriage is a covenant relationship that is supposed to last for life. So if we are married, if we may get married in the future, if we have kids or grandkids that are married, let's be teaching them that marriage is for life. Period. The end. No fine print. Jesus in Matthew chapter 19 says that marriage is for life. And while he does go on there in the text to say it is acceptable, it is permitted to divorce when your wife is not from faithful or your uh, husband is not faithful, that is not God's design. Jesus says God's design was for marriage to last for life. And so at this point, I'd like to share a piece of advice that was given to Allison and I when we were going through our premarital counseling. That just, as a matter of fairness, I only did because it saved money on the marriage license. But in that premarital counseling, the preacher doing our premarital counseling shared with this piece of advice. He said, don't say the D word. Don't say it. Not in the most angry moment, not in the worst argument. Never say the D word. Because once you say the D word, you can't unsay it. And if marriage is a lifelong covenant relationship, the D word should never be on our mind. Because divorce always involves sin. Following God in our homes means we need to remember what Jesus says on marriage. That marriage is for life, for richer or poor, for better or worse, till death do us part. Marriage is 
for life. But at the same time, we recognize that there are times when this marriages just don't stay together. Families are shattered. Families are divided. Divorce does happen. And when divorce does happen, we need to be there for our brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage them, to support them, to comfort them during that time. And if sin is involved, if a spouse has been unfaithful, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to be there to call that unfaithful spouse back to repentance, back to reconciliation with their Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to always keep in mind that marriage is not only between a man and a woman, marriage is for life. But third and finally, marriage is about the gospel. Did you realize that marriage is about the gospel? For that, I'd like to look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And we'll read verses 25 through 32 in Ephesians chapter 5. Where Paul writes there in the text, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. To make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church in him, to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands, Paul says, are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. Paul says there in verse 31, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ in the church. To sum up, Paul says there in verse 33, Each of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. Now you may be saying here, The sermon's titled Jesus on Marriage. Why in the world are we in Ephesians? Didn't Paul write Ephesians? And you'd be right. Paul did write Ephesians. But even as Paul thinks about Christianity and our faith, as he thinks about the church, he can't help but think about the example of Jesus. How Jesus loved us so much that he gave his life for us. And that selfless, sacrificial love of Christ must be seen in our marriage. That marriage and everything that goes with marriage should reflect the love of Christ. That just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, Paul says, husbands, love your wives and give yourselves up for your wives. I think it's important for us to note in Ephesians chapter 5, that everything about leadership, everything about headship in Ephesians chapter 5 there in the home or in the church is about service, it's about sacrifice, and it's about sanctification. And so Paul says there in Ephesians chapter 5, husbands, the way we love our wives, the way we lead our wives should reflect Christ's love for the church. You know, a lot of husbands say, I'm willing to die for you, honey. A lot of husbands are willing to take a bullet for their families. But are we willing to live for them? Are we willing to do the little stuff for them? You know, I heard a story this week on Ephesians chapter 5 that this seminary student wrote on this paper. And he was talking about to his wife and said, Honey, I love you. I would die for you. And his wife goes, That's great. Can you take out the trash on your way to your death? You know, sometimes husbands, we're willing to do the big sacrifice. We're willing to do the really big things, like take a bullet for our wives. But we're not willing to take out the trash. We're not willing to do the dishes. And I think this is going to get me in trouble when I get home. But we're not willing to do the dishes. We're not willing to do those small things for our wives. But wives, meanwhile, there in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22, have this instruction. Wives, Paul says, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Wives are called to submit as to the Lord. 
That just as a wife would submit to the Lord, that's how you're supposed to submit to your husband. You submit wives because you want to glorify your king. Let's be clear here. Wives are not called to submit because they're less worthy. Wives are not called to submit so their husbands can be a tyrant. By the way, wives, if your husband is a tyrant, he's in sin and that needs to be addressed. Wives are called to submit to give the world a picture of the church's submission to Christ. The submission Paul calls for here in the text is a submission to the loving leadership of a faithful husband. That in providing a, an example of submission to the loving leadership of a faithful husband, the wife provides that picture of the church's submission to the loving leadership of a sacrificial savior. And just so we're all on the same page, the whole of the Christian life, husband and let's be honest, wife, is about submission. To be a disciple of Christ, to be a follower of Christ, is a call to submit your life to Christ. And so the wife's submission here in Ephesians chapter 5 is just another aspect of love. That she gives up her own rights and her own things to submit to her husband. And the husband shows his love by sacrificing and showing his love for his wife. That's God's design for marriage. Two people constantly sacrificing, constantly submitting to one another. A man and a woman joined together in holy matrimony that reflects the life and a lifelong bond that reflects the glory of the gospel. That shows the sacrifice of our Savior and the submission of the church. Does that describe our marriage tonight? Do our marriages look like Christ, or the church's submission to Christ? Husbands, do we love our wives as Christ loved the church? Because as we think about how Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it, that's the gospel. That all the way back in John chapter 3, verse 16, that passage that we know so well, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever will believe would not perish, but have everlasting life? Isn't the gospel all about Jesus coming to earth, sacrificing for us, for our good, for our benefit, so we could be saved? Isn't that the gospel message? Husbands, are we showing that kind of love to our wives? Wives, are you submitting to your husbands? Are we following what Jesus says? on marriage. If you're not a disciple of Christ, you can become one tonight by simply submitting to what Jesus has to say for your life. By coming forward, accepting Jesus as your Savior, confessing Him as your Lord, repenting of your sins, dying to sin in the old way of life, rising anew in the waters of baptism to live for Him. If you would like to begin a life of submission to your Savior. You can tonight, and we would love to do that. If we can help you in any way, why not tonight? Why not become a disciple tonight? Please let us know as we can stand and sing.